afternoon and welcome to day four of our Northamptonshire Health and Care Virtual Wellbeing Conference 2021. My name is Anne Linsell and I'm here today to facilitate our session Menopause and Raising Awareness in the Workplace. This is all about raising the awareness of menopause, what the menopause is, how the symptoms can affect somebody at work and how to get support. So I'm joined today by my colleague Dawn and um, others behind the scenes and um, we will be supporting you managing the chat making sure that everything works as um, as it should to ensure that you can get the absolute most out of this session today. I know we've all been using Teams pretty extensively since the um, start of the pandemic but just a reminder that cameras and microphones have been switched off for now but they will be turned on later in the session. You can use the chat box to ask questions, share your thoughts, share your reflections and learnings. And you can also use the raise your hand function um, towards the end of the session to ask any questions directly of our presenters, Anne-Marie and Sarah. If for any reason you're on a, on a device that doesn't allow you to have a raise your hand function, just put it in the chat and we can bring you onto screen. We are recording this session today so that colleagues can um, who aren't able to attend can watch on demand and that's a really important part of the festival that it's accessible to everybody and I'm appreciating that lots of people aren't able to um, take the time um, to be able to access in the slots available. And finally um, we have you if you for hearing impaired colleagues you do have the ability to turn on live cap individually for you on the session. You can only do that if you're on a computer with the Teams app. Um, unfortunately, it's not enabled currently on phones or iPads or similar. So we will be using Slido during this session today. I'm just going to flick onto the screen. The Slido allows us to get sort of real life interaction with the audience. So there's a question on the screen. What are you hoping to learn from this session? You can either hold your phone up, phone camera up to the QR code on screen and your browser will take you through to the question and you enter your response. Or you can click on the link that my colleague Louise is just going to post into the chat and, um, and, and put your responses in that way. So if I could ask you to go on to Slido and um, put your responses into the question. So uh, what are you hoping to learn from today's session? And I think my colleague Louise is just going to post it into the chat. There we go. It's gone into there now. So you can either use a QR code or um, hold your camera up. So we've got taking information back to staff. Really important to share because um, and have conversations about this topic. And Anne-Marie and um, Sarah, if you want to comment on this as well, please feel free. I know you haven't introduced yourselves yet, but yeah, you come through sharing with the team. How you can be supported in the workplace, really important. And, um, and the, the information's coming through. So to think about the impact of changes relating to the menopause and how this is acknowledged within, um, that's within NHFT what to look out for in friends, families or colleagues that might be experiencing menopause. Really important point that because, you know, we're all surrounded by by women that at some point will be going through the menopause. So really important. Sarah, Anne-Marie, anything you want to add? Yeah, I love the one that realised not going mad. I think that, that's a key one. <laughs> um, certainly um, when you look at the symptoms, um, some of the symptoms, I think that's, that's a really important one. So thank you for putting that, whoever put that one in. I was going to say the same, absolutely. It's joining the dots between the symptoms and we're going to kind of come on to that later on. All about supporting colleagues um, going through the, the menopause, adjustments that can help. Anne-Marie, I know you're going to talk about that. Techniques to help manage hot flushes and low self-esteem. We're going to come on to all these sorts of things. We're going to come on to symptoms. We're going to come on to different ways of managing symptoms as well. So I think I'm hoping that you're going to feel there's quite a lot of takeaways from the session as well. We were talking about this earlier, weren't we, Anne-Marie? Definitely. I mean, there's a lot that we're going to talk about surrounding support. And I think a lot of people have posted about support. So and, and what to do and um, yeah, how, how to support others as well as yourself. Brilliant. Really Thank you. 
Well, we, we, we're seeing lots of um, lots of stuff coming in on Slido. There's also a comment in the chat, a better understanding of myself and others who may be in the same position. So brilliant. So for colleagues on the call, if you can keep Slido open, we will be using it again later on in the session. But at this point, I'm very delighted to be able to invite Anne-Marie and Sarah to well, they are on screen, but to lead the session. Over to you guys. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for inviting us uh, to present at this session. I think we, we think it's a really key um, subject. It's one that's close to our hearts. Um, I better just introduce myself before I get carried away. So my name is Anne-Marie Dunkley. I'm the Health and Wellbeing Manager at Northampton General Hospital. And I'm Sarah Faraday and I'm Acting Health and Wellbeing Manager at Kettering General Hospital. And it's such a pleasure for Anne-Marie and I to deliver this session jointly and to share some of the work we've been doing at both trusts as well. So thank you for inviting us. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So we've only got an hour, so we're going to be going through this. It will be quite quickly, but hopefully you still will be able to take something away from this. So what we're going to be talking about, what we're covering is why menopause at work is important, getting menopause on our agenda. So we're going to talk you through a bit about what we have been doing, as Ferris just mentioned, some tips for raising awareness in the workplace. So if you haven't, if you haven't embarked on this journey at the moment hopefully this will help you to start and um, some common menopause myths uh, what is menopause and then it's over to you for which symptoms affect you the most while you're at work so that's where we use the slido um, how to manage symptoms at work so we'll be going through a few of those different ways of managing menopause um, the all important support and information. So this is your takeaway. So if you're if you're able to, um, I think we'll put something in the chat for you to to download and take away with you. And um, at the end, we'll have space for questions and answers. So hopefully we'll cover everything for you. Uh, next slide, please. And the next one, please. Thank you. So why is menopause at work important? Well, it's it's important to highlight this because as we are an ageing population, the UK workforce is getting older and we're seeing a higher number of women, of women in employment, um, which means actually that there's more women more than ever um, going through menopause while they're at work. Um, menopausal women are actually the fastest growing demographic in the workplace. Which, which is um, which is great actually to see so many people at work. It's so important to support menopausal women. So symptoms symptoms can impact on working life. Um, some symptoms can actually be a bit more serious than others and can have a huge impact while you're at work. So it's important um, that we cover these. Um, some people just have such a, a huge impact these symptoms that they even one in four have considered leaving their job. Now this could be down to lack of confidence, low self-esteem, crippling anxiety. There's lots of symptoms that could be associated with work and having um, a big impact on that. So um, employers are therefore losing valuable talent. These women at the top of their game, they, they bring with them lots of experience, a um, lot of a whole wealth of knowledge. Um, it's important that we keep these people at work and, and make sure that they feel valued, supported, and more importantly, that they feel like they're not alone. And we're raising these issues. And we want to give our colleagues um, the confidence to have conversations, open up conversations with their line managers, with their peers, um, with anyone who's going through the same thing as they are, just to feel that they're not alone. Thank you. Next slide, please. So talking about why menopause is important to get on our agenda, it's really important to offer training for colleagues. I know that when I started my menopause journey, finding out re really reliable information was really difficult. So it's important to offer training for colleagues in the workplace. Um, and I know that we'll come on to some of um, what we've done later on. Um, it's important about opening up those conversations about menopause. And this isn't just for for female colleagues. I mean, this is for um, male managers and for male colleagues whose um, um, parents or girlfriend, partner, et cetera, might be going through menopause to help them understand. Um, and also 
understanding the menopause journey, what the symptoms are, and really starting to help inform better information in the workplace about it, and really reducing stigma. For me, it feels like menopause is almost as important or as important as talking about mental health. We really, with the pandemic, we're starting to ask people how they are and really want to understand how they are. And it's breaking down the stigma because I know I certainly didn't choose the menopause and it's just one of those things that happens. We can't stop it. And it's really important to break down the stigma. Um, Anne-Marie, do you want to just mention briefly about accreditation here? Does that yes, make sense? I, was, I was going to say, actually, I wish we could stop it. I mean, <laughs> give anything to stop that. But yes, <laughs> we're, we're really proud. Uh, we, we're just working towards, this is for our hospital group, um, accreditation. We're working towards um, standards for being um, menopause-friendly employers. So that this is huge for us. This is, I think, this is the first uh, of its kind for the, the company or the organisation we've gone through for this. So we will be working towards these standards. Um, that's a huge lot of work that we'll be doing and we'll be involving um, our colleagues as well. So um, watch this space if you if you work for our, our group. I think it's interesting as well, because I don't know about um, yourself at Northampton, Amory, but we started our menopause journey two years ago, pretty much to the day. So we started, we had an organisation in to do some colleague trait to tra do train the trainer and then offered colleague sessions. So it, it's been in a rel relatively short space of time, which is really exciting to be able to do this. Definitely. I mean, we, I think we started three years ago, so pretty much almost around the same time. But it's um, it's just it's always I always find that it's one of the fastest booked health and well-being initiatives that we run. There's just so many people who, you know, really want to join in. And it's great. And we've had men in the audience as well, which is fantastic. So menopause is it affects everybody. As Sarah's just said, it's not just about women. It's also about partners and those in a supporting role as well. Absolutely. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? Thank you. So some top tips for raising awareness in the workplace. So if you are at the start of your journey, um, this is, I would say, is the key, the key um, place to start. Know your demographics. So if you know um, a bit about who your audience are. So, for example, across our group, we have 80 percent female staff, 34 percent of which are age 45 and over. Um, senior leadership support. We are so lucky to have the support and the commitment from our senior leadership team. Um, they're backing us with this. Um, they're really keen for us to, to keep going with this and also working towards the accreditation. So it doesn't matter what size your organisation is. If you can get your senior leadership team on board, that is really helpful. I know that menopause is one of our key priorities in our health and wellbeing strategy. And also we embed this across um, our hospital group um, within our annual health and wellbeing programme. So we're lucky that we can actually thread that in and hopefully make that part of our culture. Communication. Communication is key. Again, it doesn't matter how big or small your organisation. If you can print out posters, pop them in um, restrooms, um, staff areas where, where people go, they can have a chat about it. Just a bit about um, menopause symptoms where people can just have a look and just take some time out to, to read that. Um, you can put it in staff briefings. We're, we're lucky we have all staff bulletins um, across our group, so we're able to get um, our health and wellbeing messaging across that way. Um, if you've got a closed Facebook group, um, use that as a platform. WhatsApp groups, um, internet pages, if you're a larger organisation, it's worth building that. I know we're actually in the process of building that for our staff. Um, where people can go in and access the information. It's good to have different routes and um, whatever works for your, your organisation. But it's, it's, it's worth bearing in mind if you are a larger organisation to use different platforms. It just makes it easier for people to access um, information and also um, and get some support. It's, it's a good place to like a one stop shop of where you can find support. And I'd also link if you are working towards a campaign, 
link it in with National Awareness Days. So, for example, 18th of October is World Menopause Day. So that's a really good launch date. And also you've got um, International, Wo International Women's Day on the 8th of March. That's a good one as well. So if you're looking to, to sort of put this on the back of something, it's really good to bear in mind these National Awareness Day. Next slide, please. So coming on to some common menopause myths. Um, menopause really isn't very well understood. There's so many assumptions which actually can be really, um, really distressing for colleagues going through the menopause. Oh, it's age related. It must be your age. I know Anne Marie is going to come and talk um, later on um, about different stages of menopause and that it isn't necessarily linked to your age. And it's so disrespectful to say, oh, well, that's her age. She's going to be going through the menopause. Equally, just assuming that it's mature ladies having hot flushes, there is so much. And we're going to come on to this later. Um, and when we come to the Slido, you'll have your opportunity to mention what symptoms you're experiencing most. Um, but it's not just hot flushes. It's not also just grumpiness or moodiness. And it's so disrespectful and so rude to call it the change. I mean, I think that was back in my mum's day, you know, oh, you're going through the change. It, the, there's so much information out there now and I think it's really important to start promoting um, information and, and accurate information not myths because it's just so damaging and and yeah really really inappropriate information so I'm hoping that this is going to bust some of those myths and come come to really be really informative for you so next slide please so what is menopause? So menopause is actually um, when a woman hasn't had her period for 12 consecutive months. That's at the stage where a, a woman has reached the end of her reproductive life. I, I don't like that term because it's like the end of something, but I actually see it as something that should be embraced. This is a new chapter. This is something else that's starting. So um, I don't like to think of it as the end of something, but that is the technical term for it. Um, and it's also a natural part of ageing. Uh, it shouldn't be something that's feared as well. Um, in the UK, the average age of menopause is actually 51. No, I didn't know this. Um, I didn't know this before we held the workshops. Um, perimenopause, for example, I'm going to just talk you through the, the different terms of so perimenopause. I'd never heard of this, if I'm honest, um, say five, six years ago. What is perimenopause? I didn't know that it was a, a term. I didn't know what it was about. I certainly didn't think it was going to happen to me. Um, all I knew about menopause was it was something that was going to happen I didn't know when or what it was. It was this big, scary thing that, that happened to my mum, but it was never spoken about. So to me, it's like, what is this that's going on? I, I don't know what's going to happen. So perimenopause, most women who are going through perimenopause aren't even aware of it. If I take you back to the, our first workshop, I don't think I'm alone when I was in the audience and um, the trainer was, was talking about perimenopause and it was a real light bulb moment I think not just for me but I think for lots of others where the symptoms which I'll come on to in a minute um, in isolation you wouldn't necessarily connect that with menopause you just think something's happening to me and like somebody put in the slido there realizing that you're not going mad <laughs> that for me was a real eye-opener um, seeing those lists of symptoms and there's a lot of them and then linking it back and I thought actually I'm not old enough I it can't be happening to me I was 44 at the time and I thought no this, this isn't right it's not happening to me but actually yes it was so perimenopause so this is the moment in time when um it normally occurs between ages 45 and 55 um what happens there is this is where you start to notice the changes so it could be subtle changes so you could still be having your periods but things will change so again that's when I was thinking back to well I'm still having periods so that's still that's still okay right but actually no the changes are that you may um, have your periods not as frequently um, it might start to start to notice that um, the difference in when you're coming on, it could be a couple of days um, here or there, just different from when you would normally have your period. Um, also, your periods could get a lot lighter, but also on the flip side, they could get become a lot heavier. Now, I know that that's really difficult. Um, it certainly is in 
like me, it, it's quite heavy anyway. It's, 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 it can be quite um, problematic, actually. Um, so this is where you start to notice things like that and um, some of the other symptoms that are associated with perimenopause. So it could start to mean the hot flushes, the night sweats, um, mood swings and things like that. So that's where you will notice as well that your periods will start to become less frequent which I move on to menopause now. So menopause is actually one day. It's a one day event. So menopause is actually the day, it's 12 months plus one day that you haven't had a period for. So it's the one day event. Um, post menopause actually is the rest of your life. So it's after that 12 months plus one day, plus another day and the rest of your life. So they, these are the terms. Um, what I will say is perimenopause normally hits when there's other major life events going on. You're busy, you're holding down a job, you're looking after a family. You could have teenage um, children um, going off to university. So they're, they're leaving a, a bit, big gap in your life, really. Um, you could be looking after your ageing parents. You could be coping with bereavement. There's a lot going on. Uh, next slide, please. There's also, you may have heard of um, the term premature menopause. Now, this affects women who are aged 40 and under, and it actually affects one in 100 women. And there's no real reason for this. It could be genetics. Um, it could be due to surgery. Um, it happens to, to a number of women. And sadly, it's not always picked up because, again, you know, if, if we're feeling like that with perimenopause and um, for the younger women, it can be quite stressful. Um, early menopause is that hits somebody uh, when they're aged 40 to 45. So that's that's another term. Um, it could also be um, due to surgery. So if you've had a hysterectomy or an oophorectomy, or it could be induced by chemotherapy or radiotherapy drugs. Um, next slide, please. So coming on to the menopause in terms of the hormones involved. There's three main hormones which affect you in the menopause, and they are oestrogen, progesterone and testosterone. I'm not going to go into these in too much depth, but between them, these three hormones regulate so many things of our natural cycle. They help regulate um, menstrual cycle, whether that's heavy or light or whether there's changes. These hormones help regulate concentration, sleep, mood libido and if you have an appointment with your GP please don't be surprised if they ask about your libido because it can be really really affected by um, hormonal changes um, bone density motivation and cognitive function so there's some pretty pretty difficult tough stuff going on there and this happens naturally this isn't because of anything we're doing or not doing. This isn't because of anything that we should be doing. These hormone levels start naturally to change. And so it's interesting to link, Amory, you were mentioning about um, the timing and, and the perimenopause. It's really interesting to notice those changes in the perimenopause because the perimenopause, remember the menopause is just one day. And I was so shocked to hear that. So the perimenopause is the time when you're going to start to feel the physical symptoms um, and changes in the way that you feel. And remember, that's between um, between four and eight years, really roughly. These hormone levels start to drop very slowly. So you don't suddenly wake up one day, fine, and the next day, that's it. You have all of these um, symptoms suddenly come on. It can change very gradually. And that's often why it's really hard to pinpoint what's going on, because, like I say, these happen, these changes can happen really gradually. So could I have the next slide, please? So what is menopause? So we're just going to go through um, actually on the next slide, some of the symptoms. So as Sarah said before, fluctuating hormones actually cause the symptoms. So if you're aged between um, 45 and 55, which is when menopause hits, your hormones are actually on a roller coaster. So it's, it's a real wavy graph. But if you're aged um, between, say, 40 and 45, it, it is more steady. So actually, um, to determine whether or not you are perimenopausal, if you're below age 45, um, 
you could go to your GP and get a blood test and they'll be able to, to test your hormones and have a look at that. Whereas if you're age 45 and over um, and you're presenting with some of the symptoms, then they would naturally presume that you are um, perimenopausal. There are over 48 symptoms. Don't want to scare you. You won't be um, experiencing all 48 at the same time. You will only be experiencing some of them. Um, but not all at the same time. But th the symptoms will come and go. So you could learn, um, you could be going through some ex um, experiences of symptoms, um, say hot flushes one week, and it could move on to joint pain um, another week. But the symptoms can last between four and eight years, and actually they can last beyond that. But as I say, I don't want to scare you, but there are over 48 of them. So again, some of the, the symptoms that you probably would never um, associate with menopause. Next slide, please. This is where it's over to you. So we would like to know if you've got your phones and you're still in Slido, we would like to know what is the symptom that affects you the most while you're at work? Please be as honest as you, as you can be. Um, doesn't have to be one, but um, the main ones, top three, I'd say, um, if you're able to do that. One of the reasons we wanted to include the, this section in here is to give you, you, you a chance to actually give us some feedback and to feel that this is a space where you can share some of your symptoms. Oh, brain fog, that's huge. Yes, I can certainly <laughs> identify with that. Can you, Sarah? <laughs> Absolutely. Hot flushes, yeah, flushes. Tiredness, oh, the tiredness. Sometimes it's just so hard to even get out of bed in the morning. It's just, it, it can really take over fatigue. I think the tiredness as well, when I started experiencing tiredness, it was more like, it was more like chronic fatigue. It was mm. like you are so exhausted it's like you've been steamrolled almost. Definitely, just extreme. Yes. Um, anxiety as well. Yeah, crippling anxiety. That, that's really, that's a hard one. Um, yeah, somebody um, who's normally really quite confident and yeah, just gets really anxious about different things, even small things. Yeah, that, that's a difficult one. I think the anxiety can help with, um, really affects um, it can affect your memory, but it can also affect your confidence as well. So lack of Definitely. confidence is so common. Yeah, that's a huge one. I find that's a huge one for me. And word finding, that's another one. Um, yeah, you can get halfway through a sentence, forget what it is that you want, to, the words, you can't find the words to get out and just to talk about them. Um, palpitations. Um, can I just mention palpitations? I... Um, I wouldn't say I'm a particularly anxious person, certainly pre-COVID. I wouldn't have said I was a particularly anxious person, no more overthinking than the average average person. I started to notice palpitations and I thought I was literally having a heart attack. They were so strong and it was the fluttering. It was really intense. Mm. I did go and get checked out, obviously, with the GP. Um but it was down to menopausal symptoms and I had no idea until I experienced it myself. I had absolutely no idea that palpitations were part of were part of what could be menopause symptoms. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I just want to um, pick out the heavy and erratic periods. Flooding. Oh, my God. Certainly at work. I, I just find that that's very difficult and it's, it's embarrassing. Um, you know, you don't really want to be parading through an open plan office with um your um, maxi towels and, and tampons you know it's um you know or even take your bag I'm just going to take the bag to the toilet and who knows what you've got in the bag so uh for me I just try and stick it up my um my sleeve or down my top or anything just try to sort of go to the loo it's it, it's hard and if you get up out of your chair and you think you know have I you know, you could just feel that wash and is that still on your chair? And if you're on your feet all day, that, that's very difficult as well. Just trying to um, you know, factor the time in to go and change. Um, lack of concentration. <laughs> yeah. Can I tell you a bit? Mm. Um, I noticed on there that um, we've got itchy ears and itchy bits. Do you know it's... So itchy bits? <laughs> oh, thank you for being so honest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, like we said, you know, we said this is a space for you to share what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. It's really common to have, 
you know, we all we all know really pretty much about your hot flushes, your night sweats, your tiredness, etc. Some of those um, itchy sensations can be really rare, but for the people experiencing them, they may not be experiencing lots of other symptoms, and to them, it's it, you know, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's really common to have almost like um, the sensation of kind of crawling insects on your skin, that kind of itchiness as well. So that Definitely. is, it, it, but it's not really spoken about. No, and vaginal dryness as well. Yeah, that's featuring quite heavily there. Yeah, absolutely. That's and again, it's breaking down the stigma. It's talking about these things. Vaginal dryness, it's, if you're experiencing it, it's really, really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. There can be so many other elements of that it's it's so unpleasant and talk, talking about it's really important and breaking down the stigma and really helping inform colleagues about what's going on and what they could experience tearful as well it's so, yeah definitely it's like yeah sense burning tongue as well I, I haven't experienced that myself um but yeah, I, I have read about burning tongue syndrome. It's, that can be quite distressing, I would have thought. Yeah, pins and needles as well. Oh, thank you very much for being so open and honest. This is a real insight, actually. Yeah, thank you. OK, shall we move on? Because I'd like to give you some hints and tips for just some of the symptoms, if that's OK. Thank you so much to everybody for doing that. So um, how to manage symptoms at work. We've taken three and um, we thought they may have been the top three, but we were. Well, we could have been wrong, but I, I just wanted to um, to address some of those. So hot flushes. So what can you do while you're at work? So, again, it's having those open and honest conversations uh, with your line manager, if possible. So it's just looking at those um, adjustments that you can make. Um, so, for example, if you layer your clothing, so if you've got a, a little a T-shirt or something on, a little top underneath um, a shirt or um cardigan or something like that so you can kind of peel away the layers um, obviously if you're wearing a uniform and um, if you're able to to have access to changing facilities um, and showering facilities as well um, I don't know what fibres or what fabrics the uniforms are made of but um, I'm hoping that we might be able to or if they do have anything that's made of uh, natural fibres I'm, I'm not sure uh, what we have but um, using fans desk fans if you're able to order any of those or maybe move your if you could ask to be moved to um, a desk that's closer to an opening window if, if that's the case if you are um, office based as well. Um, have you got access to fresh drinking water that could help so that can bring the hot flushes down if you cool yourself or if you're actually um, if you're able to use a spray just to spray your face um, just to cool yourself down a bit um, if you have access to a quiet area as well just to so you're able to leave the room if you need to just to, to sort of um, gather your thoughts as well and, and to take some time out and um, have some water insomnia now Lack of sleep, no one can function without sleep, this, this I think is a big one. So insomnia could actually be linked to a lot of other um, of the symptoms. So it's basically looking at going back to sleep basics. So just look at your bedroom. So before you go to bed, so an hour or so before, is it the right temperature? And um, do you have blackout blinds and curtains? So like at the moment in the mornings, the, the light is streaming in if you're waking up four o'clock and it's still it's light and it's hard to get back to sleep. So just look at the, your curtains, look at your bedding as well. You can now buy cooling bedding. There's a range uh, I think in Next and M&S that do um, cooling bedding, so moisture wicking sheets. Um, and things like that, um, wearing natural fibre um, pyjamas and nightwear. Again, you, or you could layer your bed with sheets instead of a heavy duvet. Um, you can buy cooling pillows. They're really good. So places like The Range, uh, Wilkinson's, um, just pop them in. I wouldn't recommend putting your head directly on them because they can get quite cold, but just slip it into your pillowcase. You've got a little bit of a barrier there. Um, if your mind is whirring in the middle of the night, you wake up and you just can't empty your mind, uh, Bring a, take a notebook to bed with you. Just empty your mental intray, get that down, just write it down, empty your mind and then and put that away. Um, also try um, guided meditation. We still have, if you work for the NHS, we still have access to Headspace 
which is really good. Um, really good. Um, it always sends me back off to sleep. So so that works for me. But it's finding out what works for you. Um, if you do work in the middle of the night, maybe try not to look at, um, well, your phone for one, uh, maybe put that away before bed. But try not to look at the time as well, because sometimes you can just get fixated on the time. Oh, it's four o'clock. I need to get up at six. I've only got two hours and I just can't get back to bed. So just try to to not look at that if possible. Um, fatigue. Um, so that could be after not sleeping at night. So ask your manager, have a, a chat with them, see if you could um, work flexibly. Maybe if you could start a little bit later and finish a little bit later and um, to make up that time. If you're doing shift work, to ask if during a period of time where you're particularly not sleeping, maybe you might be able to swap your shifts with some other colleagues um, if they're able to help out. Um, Working from home as well, if you're able to do that, if you're if you are office based and you're able to and your line manager agrees to that, that could help you. So um, you don't have the commute back into work. You can maybe spend that time um, just taking it easy, actually, and um, easing yourself in uh, without that commute and that extra stress as well. Um, as I say, some people don't experience all, all of these symptoms, but some of these are, are main, the main symptoms. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to, going to come on now into three sections about different ways of managing the menopause. And the first section is medical. I want to just be really clear here. This isn't about advocating or promoting HRT, OK? There are lots of programmes, um, some programmes you may have seen on television recently. Um, I won't name them, but you may have seen them recently, and I know they had quite a lot of backlash about HRT was the only thing that was promoted. So I just want to be really clear. This is not about promoting HRT as a single solution. OK, it's about informing and helping inform all of you on the presentation, whether you're watching it now or watching it at a later stage. It's just helping give you some information. Um, I'm taking HRT. Um, I would say I'm very much about informing yourselves about what's right for you. For me, it was a hugely personal decision and one that probably took me the best part of about, I would say, two and a half years. So it's not something that I took lightly. So I just want to be really clear that this isn't about HRT as the be all and end all. OK, this is just about informing you about what's available. Um, so. HRT replaces the hormones that are lost through the natural progression of um, menopause. They can come in different forms, so they can come in tablets, patches. Um, you can also have them as a coil, depending on what type of um, HRT you're having. They come in a gel. So what I use is um, estrogel, and that's a pump in the morning um, on either arm or on either, um, either thigh. Um, and they can come as a spray. They can also come as a cream. Um, an oestrogen cream which can be applied um, vaginally or also pessaries as well which can help with vaginal dryness. It's a really really personal decision and for me when I was kind of informing myself about what was going on it felt like a huge life-changing decision um, and what I found out subsequent to this about HRT I found a really good resource which will be on the resources page as well. There's a um, a doctor called Dr Louise Newson, who is known as the, the menopause doctor, and that's her Instagram and Facebook handle, etc. She is a GP who's experiencing the menopause and she wrote an easy HRT prescribing guide. Now, this is technically for GPs to prescribe HRT, but it's really, really informative. It's a helpful place to start. I'm not suggesting you read this and take the decision to to um, take HRT because it's a personal decision but lots of people that may want to take it aren't able to and lots of people that may want to take it um, you, know, you know may want to look into it further but what, what it did for me was it really clearly explained the different types of HRT and the pros and cons and that for me was just really straightforward so I just want to be really clear that this is about helping inform um, as part of this presentation we're not advocating that individuals should try this or try that. So it's just to really inform you about what the medical side of HRT is. 
Um, could I have the next slide, please? So coming on to complementary, I am a great believer in trying things naturally as a, on a personal level. And I started off um, trying um, vitamins, um, which I found really helpful, um, especially the ones with added calcium and magnesium, because we talked about earlier about bone density and about fatigue. Obviously, calcium can help with bone density and magnesium can be really beneficial for fatigue, um, muscle tiredness, etc. Um, but again, it's it's finding reputable sources of the vitamins. Um, there are some supermarket owned brands. Um, there are some more well-known brands, Menapace, etc. And it's helping inform yourself about that. For me, for me, the sensations and, and the um, kind of the alleviation of symptoms are very subtle with the vitamins. But what I would say, when I went away for a few days pre-COVID, um, I didn't take them with me and I noticed that I was actually more tired and there was no other reason for that. So it's quite subtle, but again, it's not for everybody, but it's a starting point. You could look at some herbal remedies as well. Soya isoflavones can be known to be helpful. Again, they may come with a little contraindication. So don't make the assumption that just because something's complementary or natural that it's safe, because there can be some contraindications. I know with soy isoflavones, I think there's a risk where if you've had a history of breast cancer, you do need to be quite careful of that. Uh, red clover can be known to be helpful. Um, black cohosh can be known to be helpful for some people. I tried black cohosh for uh, night sweats and I found it really helped me for the first couple of weeks. Um, but I have a really, really low sensitivity of any kind of um, herbal medication or any kind of um, normal medication. So for me, I started to notice I felt quite dehydrated. And when I looked at some of the contraindications for black cohosh, it said it can affect liver function. So it's really important to just try maybe have a look, have a look into some complementary things. But just be aware that just because they're natural or complementary may not mean that they don't have some kind of contraindications. And what I would say is, if you're going to try some complementary uh, remedies, go and ask, go and ask somebody's advice, either in Boots or Holland and Barrett or other health food shops. Actually, go and ask people's advice. And I think if you do want to start somewhere, try maybe one or two things at a time. If you end up trying three or four things and, and you start to feel a little bit better or some of the symptoms are alleviated um, or man or you feel you're managing better, you're not going to really know what's helping if you're trying four or five things. So it's it's just being really sensible there. So, Amory, do you want to mention anything about the vitamins? Because I know, did you have an experience? Yes, yeah, um, I, I take vitamins. Um, I take so many vitamins, it's, I'm surprised I don't rattle. Um, my dog's here so in the morning thinking I'm going to give her one. Um, but yeah, I, I've noticed that taking magnesium really helps with my tiredness and fatigue. Uh, that's that's helped me enormous, enormous, I can't say it, enormously. <laughs> Whoops. So, magnesium, also iron. Uh, with the heavy bleeding, with the flooding, I, I find that helps as well, just um, to get my levels back up. I take, um, <laughs> there's a whole host of these, uh, cod liver oil from my joints um, and also brain power, um, evening primrose oil, high strength, uh, vitamins D, B and C as well. So I, I have a whole host of, um, of vitamins and turmeric as well. So, yeah, I found vitamins really, really helped me. I did notice a difference. And I will say if you are looking at trying something different, um, obviously go to your GP first and just make sure that this is OK to take if you are taking other uh, medications. But also give it some time, give it at least three months to see if it is making a difference and if that will help you. But I have really noticed a difference with the vitamins. I will say that. Yeah. I think it can make a difference and if you're not sure where to start I think it's a good starting point. Um, I started off with some of the menopause multivitamins and I think having a multivitamin like menopause or something formulated for menopausal women can be really helpful because it's usually got all of those benefits, all of those multivitamin, all of those vitamins in there um, and then you can experiment if you do need to up the levels of calcium or magnesium etc you can try that so. That's a good Saying start. that though, 
interestingly, I took menopause. I just couldn't take it. I had excruciating headaches. So I stopped that straight away and it was quite expensive as well. So I'm pretty gutted. I haven't touched it since. But that's when I started taking the vitamins. So um, the, the vitamins that I've just mentioned really helped me. Uh, but the menopause didn't. It was, um, yeah, the, the headaches were, were terrible. And, and I... I guess I associated it that with that but um, I mentioned before that symptoms can come and go so it may have just have been a case of me getting headaches at that time but I associated that with the vitamins mm -hmm. um, I did actually forget to mention about um, keeping a diary actually of, of what you're using so that can can help you going forward I could have the next slide please so lifestyle, that's another way. So again, you can combine lifestyle. So I have been obviously looking at lifestyle as well um, as the vitamins and also I'm I'm on HRT. But um, lifestyle should be something that we look at anyway. But I think even more so, it's more important at, at this stage um, keeping active. I know the last thing you want to do is get up and do a run, certainly if your joints are hurting. Um, for me, uh, my joints hurt just walking up the stairs here at work. It's, it's very difficult. So I think um, the important thing is to keep active. Just do as much as you can. Just go for a walk. Take a break at lunchtime if you're able to. That helps no end with your symptoms. Just getting active, moving more, but just upping it slightly. If you've got a dog, take it out. Just enjoy the outside and take a bit of a breath, air, breath of fresh air and a breather. Um, taking your breaks while you're at work. I know it's so easy to just sit at your desk and carry on, or even if you're busy on your feet on the ward, just to do bear in mind to take your breaks and also your annual leave. If you're, if you're able to just take your leave, just take that time out. It's important to recharge yourself. At uh, this, this time of life, this stage in your life is actually this is where you kind of turn your focus onto you you've been so busy looking after everyone else and I think the theme throughout this week for the festival is self-care you know it, it can't be more important it's um you do need to look after yourself but I'd like to think of it as self-care without the guilt so put you first and um yeah look after yourself so yeah keep active so it could be going for a walk it could be um yoga it could be swimming which can help ease your joints um just do just bear that in mind just do a bit more than you normally would um massage oh my favorite my favorite form of self-care i love massage i try to book in as often as i can um possibly every six to eight weeks but you don't have to do that if it's too expensive but just take that time out as well you know get your partner to massage you just to take that bit of a breather again, rest, relax, and also um, reflexology. Um, reflexologists are really good. Um, they can pinpoint certain pressure points on your feet. Sarah, have you had any reflexology? Oh, try and stop me. <laughs> <laughs> bit like me with the massage. <laughs> I think I was so happy when restrictions changed and I could actually book in for reflexology. I booked about six sessions and said, please let me see you. My feet need you. It's yeah. amazing what they can identify from from your feet as well. It really is. And like you say, they can pinpoint specific areas, but just in general, it makes you feel so much better. Yeah. And it's so well, it can be if that's your thing, but it can be so relaxing as well. And it, like you said, Amory, it's taking time for you. It's that self-care. Definitely. The massage. I just float out of there. I have a two hour massage, a, a, a facial. A, the, she starts on my body first. I have a, a full body massage and then a facial. I'm asleep. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I wake myself up by snorting and possibly dribbling as well. But I just float out of there. It's, it's wonderful. Even something like having your nails done. I love having that my nails painted, just looking down, and seeing that they're all painted just makes me feel really happy. And I think, if anything, over the last 12 months, it's really taught me to appreciate the smaller things. So anything that you can do for yourself and to improve, um, just how you're feeling. Um, I'd also say a gratitude diary. I think that's that helps me personally. Um, there could be times when you're feeling a bit low. You keep a diary. Again, small things doesn't have to be big gestures like, for example, if someone just phoned you to see how you were, someone just came into your office, 
just checking in on you. You okay? That's something really nice. Somebody's taken the time out to, to come and have a chat with you. Also, someone makes something for you. There's lots of people that make things here at uh, NGH. We're quite lucky. We've got some very talented people and they make things. They take the time out to do that for you. I just find that that's amazing. It really boosts my mood and it's, it's great. Um, look at your diet and hydration. So looking at your food, what you're eating, actually this has got quite a, a big connection to symptoms. So what you're eating, if you're um, eating processed foods, um, you're not eating your fruits and vegetables, that can have a big impact on symptoms. So look at your diary, again, keep, look at your diet, sorry, keep a diary um, to see if there is any link with what you're eating with symptoms. So for example, um, if you're eating spicy food, um, hot and spicy food that can then trigger hot flushes and um, also with alcohol so if you're able to stop alcohol or reduce your intake again if you are drinking um, just make a note of how much and if that's had an impact on you so take a look at that as well and also if you could stop smoking or reduce the amount that you smoke that is linked to um, menopause symptoms um, so just look at a balanced diet, I will say, um, just include leafy green vegetables and uh, lots of fruit if you can. Um, hydration. Now, that's amazing. Uh, water does wonders for your skin. So if, like me, you have a breakout of spots um, while you're perimenopausal, this helps to sort of flush out the system. It does. Um, it replaces the fluids that you're losing if you are going through hot flushes and night sweats. So just keep yourself hydrated. Keep an eye on how much you're actually drinking. And um, there's actually an app that Dr. Newson has out. It's called Balance. That's really good. So you've got the section there where you can track how much you're drinking and whether or not your diet is impacting on your symptoms. So that's quite a useful one. And also there's a tracker. You can get different apps actually that track uh, when your period's due when it would roughly be due so you can look at that you can look back at that and see oh, if it's um if it's changed at all um reduce stress now stress oh that's that's a really big one i think um a lot of people can be stressed and not necessarily know it um if you look at your there's something called a you could Imagine this, it's a stress container. So you've got this container and it's a, a small layer of, uh, a small layer or level of stress is okay, that's good. We, we need to function with a little bit, but actually when things like life, um, children, job, money, all of that starts piling into your container and it just begins to overflow. That's the stress that's happening there. So you need to put holes in that container or have a little valve where you can just let some of that out. So you maintain in that, that healthy level. Um, again, do things that you enjoy. So um, as I say, like over the last 12 months, it's been difficult to do that. But you know, having meals out, going for walks, seeing your friends, if you're able to um, socially distance and um, just doing that. Listen to music, dance, sing, anything that makes you feel good. Just get that stress level down after work. When you come home, just take that time. Just take even 10 minutes, whatever it is. Just take that time to just pause pause and reflect just relax for a bit and just bring those stress levels down so that does have a huge impact on your symptoms next slide please so just coming on to the resources and i think um the lovely people behind the scenes are going to be kindly put a pdf version of this um slide in the chat box for people to access afterwards so um both myself and Anne-Marie were able to do menopause in the workplace and have training from uh, a company called Henpicked. Um, and they are such a valuable source of information and training that if you want to even, um, before you even start to book uh, workplace training, have a look at their resources on their website. They're such a great resource. Um, yes. Absolutely. Very yes. approachable if you've got any questions about any of their information. Obviously, the British Menopause Society, nice guidelines. Did anybody even know there were nice guidelines around the menopause? So that's a good resource to have a look at. Um, and the um, menopause doctor that I mentioned in the um, earlier slides, Dr. Louise Newson, that's her website there, menopausedoctor.co.uk. 
And I just want to reiterate about the HRT, etc. Um, Dr. Louise Newsom, from what I can see on social media, she advocates a very holistic approach to menopause. So it's not just about HRT, it's about balance. She has um it's about balance and nutrition and yoga and exercise. And I think she promotes um, nutrition as well. I think they have a nutritionist working with them. So it's a great selection of resources. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, next slide, please. So just to really finish up, we just want to start, have those conversations in your workplace. Break down the stigma and start opening up those conversations. You will be really, really surprised by talking to colleagues and starting those conversations, how many colleagues are actually experiencing menopause. It was really funny because in an office I used to work at um, a couple of years ago, started the conversation about this. And actually two or three people in the same office were also experiencing symptoms, but were too, um, not ashamed, but were just too anxious to actually approach anybody else and say. And once we'd um, broken down that those barriers, we were then all started to talk about how we were feeling and starting to make some lighthearted, oh, should we put the fan on? Should we open the windows? You know, can we close the blinds so that it's not so hot? So it's just breaking down the stigma and really opening up about those conversations in the workplace. Definitely. And one thing I would say is that we are all unique. What happen what helps one person may not help another. We, we will all go through different stages of menopause as well. So um, just think about that and just bear in mind that we are all unique and um, yeah, everyone goes through their journey differently. Um, it does affect more people. Um, well, a lot of people actually. So either firsthand or in a supporting role. So yeah open up those conversations if you're able to. Thank you. Next slide, please. So if anyone has any questions, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat box. Um. So there's been a huge amount of um, comments in the chat box, um, including one that did make me smile, but somebody was saying that they had all 48 symptoms. Um, <laughs> which is, uh, um, there was a question through, I've just, um, for colleagues on the call, if you want to ask a question, please put it into the chat or use the raise your hand function and we can bring you onto screen. Um, there was a question, how can you find out for definite if you are perimenopausal? I can't say that now. It does depend on your age, uh, which age group you do actually fall into. So I think if you're if you're aged, um, if you're under 45, um, go and see your healthcare provider and see if they could um, do a blood test for you. If you are 45 or over, so say if you if you just look at some of those symptoms, if you in the resources that we're going to post, um, have a look at the symptoms. There should be um, a symptoms checklist, um, certainly on Dr. Newsom's um, internet page and also Hempix. Um, there is um, quite a comprehensive list of symptoms. If you're ticking off quite a few of those, then I would say that you you perhaps were perimenopausal and I'd advise you then to go and see your healthcare provider. Can I just add that, um, just to back up what you were saying, Amory, the blood test really is done if only if you're under 45, because once you're over 45, you can start to experience some of those symptoms. And so if your hormone levels are fluctuating, you may come back. And I actually had this as well. The GP suggested having a blood test um, and checking hormone levels. Um, but actually, for me, they came back as normal levels. But I knew that I was experiencing symptoms and I was definitely not feeling very normal. Um, so, yeah, just just just. Definitely. Symptom checker. I think even with the blood test, if you're age 45 or over, uh, if you have a blood test in the morning, you could you can get a different reading if you have the same blood test in the afternoon because you're on that that wavy roller coaster, if you like. It it does depend on um you know, the time of day. Um, it can come back that you're okay, as Sarah said. So um yeah, it's worth it's worth checking out. Brilliant, thank you. And again, lots of um, lots of comments in the chat about how informative people have found the session, how useful. Question that um, that I actually put in, so I'll ask it directly. <laughs> was um, you reference magnesium to help with tiredness and fatigue? But I'm just curious to know whether that helps with sleep. Mm, it it's not definite, actually. No, it it didn't help me personally with sleep because I did try uh, um, magnesium for, for quite a while it, it helped me with with the tiredness um, 
but the sleep I would say for me something that's really helped me is um, the HRT patches um, that's one major thing that I've noticed has helped me I mean some of the other symptoms are still there but um, it's about I think prioritizing your top three symptoms what's affecting you the most so for me it was actually sleep um, just couldn't function without that so I will say that that did help me um, may not help other people but um no the magnesium was more um with the the tiredness the fatigue um but it didn't really affect it, for me personally my sleep okay um, thank you what you could always do Anne, is have a look on perhaps holland and barrett or boots website and find out what um information magnesium what properties magnesium has because it might be worth um checking but magnesium does also have different formulations so i know one friend has a, a, a bath using magnesium flakes which dissolve they're a bit like the salt crystals so they dissolve in the bath so that might be something you want to try Okay, brilliant. Thank so you. So pharmacies as well, if you can go and see some of the local pharmacies, they might be able to help you too. Yeah, they're a, a real source of information, aren't they, on lots of things. So thank you for that. Another question that's come in is, what are your views, ladies, around um, sickness absence policies, specifically regarding the menopause? Ooh, that's a good question. It's something we will be looking into, researching, definitely. Um, Again, I think it works more well with the flexible working policy as well, but um, it's something we would need to look into for our, our group. Okay. Can, I just, can I just add, I think it would start off with an initial conversation with your line manager, being really open about, I think I'm going through the perimenopause, um, these are some of the symptoms I'm experiencing, um, you know, I'm just trying to get some support. What can I do to help? And it, but you know, it's very variable. Like Anne Marie mentioned at the very one of the very first slides, one in three, uh, one in four women experience really severe symptoms. Yeah. So it really varies. It's certainly something for consideration. And I'm sure, like you mentioned, Anne Marie, we'll probably be looking into that as part of the accreditation process. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think, it, as Sarah said, just opening up that conversation, if, you, if you're if you open and honest with your line manager, uh, where they can help support you and see what they can do to help. Yeah. OK, I mean, that's that's really, really useful to to hear. I suppose the challenge is with a lot of things and with a lot of the conversations actually we've had during the week of the festival, that's not always easy to have that conversation. Um, no. And sometimes I think colleagues, you know, with the variety of symptoms that you can experience, actually you might not even realise that what you're experiencing is part of the menopause mm -hmm. or the perimenopausal, sorry, I've got to use the right language, but the perimenopausal process. It's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, I, I would say depending on um, where the colleagues, um, what whereabouts in the um, system the colleague is whether they could access a session via the relevant trust or organization within the county that they're in to perhaps get some support initially also say their occupational health department and and hr department as well depending on where they are um check in with them as well okay. if it's not comfortable having a, a conversation with the line manager then then maybe go down that route Lovely, thank you. So we've had some comments from um, Lisa who said she's um, followed uh, the menopause doctor on Twitter and downloaded the app. Deborah has said that she's just booked some reflexology. So um, oh, I'm, sure. Oh, I'm sure you'll have a um, lovely session. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie's commented, um, she said, how long does it last? I'm fed up with it now. Oh. It can vary um, between four and eight years, but it it can last a little bit longer depending on on the person. Sorry to hear you. Yeah, I can well imagine. You know, yeah. I don't think anybody realises how difficult this, what a difficult time this can be. Very absolutely, absolutely. So another colleague has um who said earlier she was having trouble with the patches staying on has also <laughs> said her bloods have never never come back very high. There's nodding at that. Is that a common theme that patches? Yes. Don't yes. If you don't apply it properly, like me, sometimes if if we touch it, if it comes into contact with my fingers, it loses its um stickiness. So um, I've had many a time where I stuck it on with um plasters. <laughs> it looks very attractive. Um, <laughs> literally it's almost hanging off so um yeah i've stuck it on with plasters but i think that was um 
down to um, me touching it. But you, if you go back to see your your GP and um, see if if that's continually happening to you, see if there's another brand that you could maybe um, switch to. I know there was a real problem with patches quite a while ago um, and there was huge manufacturing issues with the glue sticking and there was people were resorting to very um, creative ways of affixing the patches to them let me say. Yes I, I, I may be guilty of some of those but um, yeah <laughs> yes very creative. So um, the, again, more comments about how informative and useful the session has been and how it, it's comforting to know that um, colleagues aren't alone. Actually, there's a, a great big group of us all experiencing different symptoms. So um, another colleague um, question in from Jane. She said, how do you deal with accepting that you've reached that stage of your life? And she's caught in brackets getting old. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to go first on that one? Oh, it's a difficult <laughs> one, isn't it? I, I don't that's... want to let it go. <laughs> well, with a big birthday coming up, I'm kind of in a bit, a bit of denial about the age thing as well. It's a really difficult one. Mm. The thing is, uh, I don't really know how to answer that. It's such a personal time oh. as well. People mm. make so many assumptions about the way you look and about your age and about symptoms and it's a really tough time. What I would say is I think for me, the thing that made the most difference is actually getting to know what symptoms I was experiencing. And like Anne-Marie said, they can change, um, but actually trying to do the best I can to manage them as best I can. Because when I was experiencing brain fog and irritability and kind of really struggling to concentrate, I just didn't feel very confident at all. I felt really low. And I think learning to manage some of those symptoms made a big difference so that kind of doesn't really answer the question maybe but yeah and I think the term where it says that you've come to the end of your reproductive life I think that's that's for me felt really sad and um, yeah I'd lost a child and I thought actually there's, there's you know I can't it's taken away from me now and there's that chance of having um another one and that sort of that end of something that that's it is quite sad and I think it's it's difficult to get your head around as well because you do think inside you feel like you're 20 maybe but you don't think that it's it's happening to you and um yeah yeah I can I don't well, we, we are all 20 aren't we we are oh, 21 it's <laughs> about 30 years so, experience <laughs> absolutely so a colleague is just uh, Melanie's just put a comment in said we must all remember we are fabulous in capitals and Aww. not defined by our fertility so um, I think that sums up perfectly yes, so again another question from Claire I'm appreciating for colleagues we're running over but I think everybody's happy to carry on the conversation for a little bit this question from Claire is is the four to eight years duration the same for those who have who have experienced early menopause mm, that's a very good question oh, I've not had that one before yeah um, I'm not sure on that one no I'm, I'm so sure. sorry so is there something we could could you ladies do a bit of um of research and we can come back to yeah that definitely that? yes yes please if that's yeah. okay if we could put together a Brilliant. list of um some answers to some questions then yes definitely we'll get back to you on that thank you okay so next question um how is best to engage male colleagues male line managers to understand the topic research states women do not disclose their uh, menopause to male line managers. Do you mind if I just start with, do you mind if I answer this part first, Amory? Is that no, okay? that's fine. Yeah. Um, what, what we did at uh, Kettering, we actually ran a session for male managers, a menopause session in the workplace um, for male managers and encouraged just male colleagues to come along so that it was a safe space for them to express comments without feeling they were going to uh, make assumptions or judgments or comments that perhaps female colleagues would have um, maybe been a bit upset or felt were very judgmental. So that's what we actually did was uh, encourage ma male colleagues to come and, and have a specific session just for them um, to help them understand. And I know in one of the sessions, uh, I think I went through about three or four slides and it was just sheer disbelief at what what we were experiencing 
and the amount of symptoms and potentially the severity of symptoms and on any one day, all of this particular manager's colleagues were probably experiencing several symptoms quite severely. Um, so I think that's potentially one way of addressing addressing that, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. And um, I think Melanie's come back, good idea, re the male menopause discussions. Although my experience, they get aversion menopause. They need to support us at home, at work, with empathy, etc. And there is a male menopause, I believe, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Andropause. Yeah. Think, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd echo what uh, Sarah said on that with um, introducing uh, workshops specifically for male or partners of uh, those experiencing the menopause. Um, yeah. And actually highlighting that as well that's um something that uh, that men do actually um go through but i think um as far as i know it's a gradual process so it's not as severe with the symptoms as for women so there is um yeah mm -hmm. is that there? excellent thank you and um sort of a final question for me just to throw it in is there support groups or anything in the county where um women can connect with others that are experiencing it and have some of these conversations not that i know of in the county um we're looking at um so for the nhs we're looking at rolling out i think something um i could be wrong on that for um for the system but um i'm not aware of anything within the county um unless it's in individual organizations um there's more the the help on internet pages and things like that facebook groups um i know sarah oh, okay. you're a member of one of um is it diane dunsey brings um facebook group yeah there's one facebook group that i'm a member of which is which i found particularly helpful and it's the menopause support network um that was one of the more helpful ones there are some other facebook groups and i think it would be down to individual taste and preference um which ones you find helpful in the end, I think a couple of them I, I left because I didn't actually find them that helpful. It was mainly people complaining and whinging about symptoms, which I actually, when I had a really bad day full of symptoms, at, at which were at the worst, actually made me feel a lot worse. Um, what I would say from a Kettering um, General Hospital point of view, I know this was raised on our last chief exec briefing about um, the menopause session and whether there would be future sessions. Um, and I know at Kettering, I'm planning on running out some dates for um, some colleague um, information sessions. So whether we form informal groups following that, that might be something uh, we could consider at Kettering anyway. I think so for, for the system as well. Um, mm. There's um, we've held menopause cafes. So on the back of our colleague sessions, we had those which was more informal. We had a real, real good attendance for that and where people felt that they could open up um, and talk about their experiences. So that's something maybe to to explore. But it, um, I don't know who raised that question, but if they could let us know where where they work, if they're happy to do that. Which organisation? That was me actually asking. I was say, oh, OK. <laughs> 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 that that. Yeah, no, 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 that was that was me asking that question. So, um, thank you. I mean, I think that's all the questions that we've had through the chat. But um, thank you so much for both of you. It's been so informative, and 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 I know you'll look at the chat when you've we've finished. But you know, people have got such a lot from it, and you know, it's some there is something about bringing the conversations into sort of the everyday and talking about menopause and it's still quite you know it's there's still stigma around it um so um it's really good to be sort of having those conversations so thank you so apologies for the noise for the doorbell going that's the first time this week my doorbell has gone and um i've been on mic so i'm I do apologize for that um, I'm just going to share my last couple of slides, hopefully, and that's going to work. So, yeah, there we go. So um, thank you to Amory and Sarah for doing this session today. Um, and thank you to the behind the scenes team as, as ever. Um, we do really love your feedback. Feedback is a real gift. It helps us shape each session and um, future events. There is a competition this year in terms of if you leave feedback, which you can do via the 
scanning the QR code on your phone like you did for the Slido or clicking the link in the chat that my colleagues just put in there um, and leave your feedback on this session or indeed other sessions that you may have attended during the week so far or indeed tomorrow. And um, there, the competition is to win a festival goodie bag, which includes books from some of our book from some of our keynote speakers and also some festival goodies to remember it from. So as they say on TV, you need to be in it to win it. I say, said that a week. I need to figure out which program it actually came from because I, I can't remember. The lottery. On that. <laughs> Was it the lottery? OK, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, again, you know, everything we've got a full packed agenda for the week. We um, still have another session now this afternoon writing for well-being. Um, we've got a full jam packed day tomorrow. Not only have we got on uh, two keynotes tomorrow, we've got Gareth Thomas who's joining us at lunchtime. Um, and we've got Ruby Wax, who's joining us again to do a mindfulness and frazzled session. And I know colleagues that were on the call on Monday, it was just amazing, her session. So I know the session later tomorrow is going to be great. And then we'll be joined by some of our system leaders to, um, to uh, four o'clock tomorrow for the closing of the festival. But everything that has happened so far, everything bar a couple of the reflection sessions are available on catch up so please take time um to log on and to watch again either watch for the first time or watch again and share with colleagues there's also some challenges on the uh, festival website we've got a stair climbing challenge which our physios have, are leading on we've got a music um it's not really a challenge, but we're trying to create a Spotify list for music for well-being. Music is so powerful in well-being. You know, sometimes just hearing a song can lift your mood and make you feel better. So we want to create a Northamptonshire Spotify playlist all about well-being. And we've also got a photography challenge, um, which started on Tuesday. So each day there's a different theme. Today's theme was looking down. Tomorrow's theme is the garden. It's not about fancy equipment. It's about taking your phone and getting outside and just taking photographs. We will also encourage you to get social and use social media tagging our NH NHCP on Facebook on um, I keep saying Instagram, but my colleague Dave this morning called it Insta. So I feel like I'm going to get down with the kids as he is and put up on Insta or Facebook. We've got the hashtag Northants Wellbeing and I always have to think as I say this, VWBF 2021. That's my menopausal brain struggling with that one. So um, I'll put it out there. And then finally, if you've been affected by anything in today's session, um, you've got the Stronger Together, Together, the Northamptonshire Resilience Hub that's available for all health and care staff in the county. We've got the Changing Minds IAP service, which is there to deal with um, talking therapies to support stress, depression and anxiety. And then finally, we've got the mental health crisis number um, and website. So please um, share with colleagues. But a final thank you again to Anne-Marie and Sarah, to the behind the scenes team and to all of you for joining today's session and for your engagement and for your sharing. But enjoy the rest of your Thursday and hopefully see you at some sessions tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.